Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University and the seminar committee, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Clifford Rosen. Dr. Rosen is a professor at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute, director of Center for Clinical and Translational Research, and he's one of the lead PIs of the Northern New England Clinical Translational Research Network. He's also the director of the Tufts Clinical and Translational Research and professor of medicine at Tufts University School of, Ar School of Medicine. The central theme of Dr. Rosen's lab is understanding the metabolic and biochemical fate of marrow stromal cells as progenitor osteoblasts and or as adipocytes. We'll hear about some of this work today. His lab has strong collaborations, both internally and with external labs in hospitals worldwide, and research interests from his lab include sophisticated primary culturing of um, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, osteocytes, and adipocytes, examining the role of irisin in bone remodeling and studying the effects of irisin on osteoclasts, understanding the in vivo roles of IGF binding proteins in defining osteoblast and osteoclast function, and combining the in vivo observations with in vitro cell culture models in order to understand the mechanisms through which these binding proteins act. Dr. Rosen is, Rosen is a great mentor and his contributions to the advancement of science and research include leadership on NIH committees and advisory boards. He is the senior associate editor of Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, associate editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, associate editor at Endocrine Reviews. He's also a member of the Endocrine Society, the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, American Academy for the Advancement of Science, and the New York Academy of Sciences. Essentially, I could go on with all of his multiple accomplishments and his um, generous contributions to science, but the point is to hear from him today. So Dr. Rosen, welcome. Thank you for sharing your research with us. We very much look forward to your talk. Thank you, Sai, very much. And um, I um, it's really a privilege to, to talk today and to present some of our newest work, some of which is not published yet, some is on the launching pad, and some are provocative questions about where to go from here. So I have no conflicts of interest. Um, and I wanna to talk to you today about really three um, aspects. One, the overview of what bone marrow adipose tissue is, and then focus almost exclusively on the signals uh, that uh, bone marrow fat gets from nutrient intake. And we're, I'm going to talk about a very unique study we did in humans that provides uh, a lot of uh, uh, answers and uh, more questions about the role of bone marrow adipose tissue and finish with some clinical and basic implications. And the take -home there are three take home messages from this talk. One, that bone marrow adipose tissue is a very unique fat depot, and I hope to prove that to you today. Two, that marrow adiposity in itself is a uh, secretory mechanism and it affects the skeleton as well as systemic me metabolism. And finally, the dietary manipulation can have a unique impact on the marrow niche. And this has widespread implications for nutritional interventions in a number of diseases, and I'll particularly focus on fasting and intermittent fasting. Uh, much of this work was done uh, by a talented uh, uh, pre-doc in a, our lab from uh, Chengdu, uh, uh, Hang Hang Lu, a dentist who uh, is just starting a postdoc uh, back at uh, Sichuan University. And the hard work was done by Puna Fazelli, who's now an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh, um, who did the clinical study that I'm going to talk about today. So bone marrow fat um, changes uh, over time. It's really non-existent in the prenatal form, but as uh, the bone marrow begins to disappear, what we call red marrow from uh, individual bones, uh, it's replaced by fat. And this has led over time to think about bone marrow fat as an inert uh, replacement to take the space of hematopoietic elements. 
Um, and as I'll show you, that's clearly not the case. This is a very dynamic organ. Uh, it has not received the attention in part because it's really only visible through histology and then indirectly because uh, histological samples are, are cut in, uh, put in paraffin or in plastics. And so all you see are adipocyte ghosts. But in fact, with the advent of uh, MRI spectroscopy, we now can visualize how marrow fat changes with time. And here you can see in this cartoon that particularly in the long bones, there's a very rapid conversion from red to yellow fat. So that by age 13 to 15, much of the uh, long bones uh, marrow has been replaced by marrow fat. That also coincidentally happens to be a time when when bone acquisition is optimal, and this raises some interesting questions about the sequence of events. In addition to being able to visualize it, you can actually quantitate the amount of marrow adipose tissue by spectroscopy, and more importantly, uh, qualitate that fat, as I'll come back to later on, into saturated or unsaturated fat. Okay, so uh, bone marrow adipose tissue is present in all mammalian species, and it's affected in a number of different ways. The process of replacement of hematopoietic tissue by marrow adipose tissue um, is accelerated by age. So as we age, uh, particularly after age 50 in our uh, axial skeleton, um, there is this uh, replacement with uh, adipose tissue uh, uh, to replace the hematopoietic elements. And then certain hormonal, nutritional, and injury-related uh, factors can certainly impact marrow fat. In the mouse, there are genetic predispositions to marrow fat. This is osmium micro-CT, and the gray indicates the replacement of the marrow with osmium positive staining of marrow adipocytes. And you can see that the C3HATJ mouse starts with a lot more marrow fat than does the black six. But interesting, marrow fat is also decreased by certain um, uh, conditions, uh, vertical sleeve gastrectomy, lactation, leptin administration, beta adrenergic agonists, cold temperature, and exerciser, just to name a few. And we'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. So the most consistent finding we see with bone marrow adipose tissue in terms of its trajectory is this uh, increase with age. And this is from a collaborator of ours at Peking University, just showing the increase in bone marrow adipose tissue with age uh, and inverse relationship between bone marrow adipose tissue and bone mineral density. So as bone mineral density declines, bone marrow adipose tissue goes up. And more recent work, both from the Iceland ages cohort that we're involved in and others has shown that saturated fat by MR spectroscopy is associated with a greater risk of prevalent vertebral fractures and incident vertebral fractures, suggesting that the marrow fat does uh, impact the skeleton in a way that is both indirect and direct. And in a recent paper that's currently under revision, um, there is strong evidence that saturated fat is associated with a reduction in uh, some of the uh, micro CT elements such as trabecular uh, architecture, uh, which is reduced by uh, saturated fat. So uh, having more fat's not good and having more saturated fat in the marrow by spectroscopy is not good either. Estrogen is probably the biggest uh, regulator of marrow adipose tissue in terms of uh, hormonal influences. And here you see that with ovariectomy in the black six mouse, you get this big increase in intra-abdominal fat. And at the same time, by osmium micro CT, you can see that virtually the whole femur is, re uh, uh, tibia, sorry, is replaced by marrow adipose tissue. Um, and we know from some human studies, this is work from Annegret Veldius, who was in our lab uh, several years ago and is now in Netherlands, um, that acute estrogen administration reduces marrow adipose tissue in the spine. Uh, and this can occur within a two week time frame, which is really rather interesting. And in addition, if you uh, stop estrogen, you get an increase in bone marrow adipose tissue. So this reflects the likelihood that adipose tissue is dynamic in terms of how it's changing. 
And in more recent work from Moni Zaidi, a collaborator of ours, he has shown that not only is estrogen deprivation a driver of marrow fat, but also FSH. So as estrogen declines, FSH goes up, and this FSH independently increases marrow adipose tissue. And with the administration of an uh, antibody to FSH, one could uh, reduce the uh, increase in marrow adipose tissue associated with ovariectomy. More recent work from our lab has focused on parathyroid hormone and its role in regulating marrow adipose tissue. Uh, intermittent parathyroid hormone treatment for osteoporosis raises bone density and enhances the recruitment of osteoblast precursors. And at the same time, it blocks the uh, adipocyte recruitment in the bone marrow. And we've been looking at mechanisms related to that uh, uh, change in uh, adipose tissue in response to PTH, and subject to a, another entire talk, but very exciting work uh, that was done principally by Hang Hei Lu in our lab. What I'm going to focus on is this paradox of uh, marrow adiposity, and that is if you feed an animal a high-fat diet, a particular high-calorie diet, as shown by Mustafa Qasim, another collaborator of ours at the University of South Denmark, you get a marked increase in marrow adipose tissue. If you calorie restrict the same mouse, and we reported this way back 11 years ago, and uh, by 30% calorie restriction, you get the same increase in marrow adipose tissue. And the focus of the, this part of my talk is really on addressing why is it that either signal can induce marrow adiposity, and what is the difference, if there is any, in the marrow adipocyte between one that's driven by starvation or fasting and one that's driven by lots of nutrients. And one of the reasons we got into this is because anorexia nervosa probably has the highest element of marrow fat uh, in human subjects that we know of. Uh, and it's so high that um, uh, in a paper we published, uh, we showed that the total fat mass of uh, in the anorexic women that we were studying at the Mass General, accounted the bone marrow accounted for 30% of the total fat mass of an individual. So of course, the denominator is going to be low because marrow adipose, because peripheral fat is so low. But the idea that during states of near starvation, one could see an increase in marrow adipose tissue is remarkable. We also see it with injuries such as radiation, and we know that um, that the insulin sensitivity associated with anorexia is probably related to an increased production of adiponectin, which is occurring coincidentally in the marrow adipose tissue. So there are other things that cause marrow adipose tissue to, to shrink or, or to disappear, and cold temperature is one of them. So once you stimulate with uh, um, the body with cold, you get this increase in beta adrenergic drive, and this uh, actually leads to a reduction in marrow adipose tissue. Lactation is another example of a reduction in marrow adipose tissue in response to, um, to a stimulus. And in both situations, uh, both lactation and in cold temperature, bone loss is occurring at the same time that marrow adipose tissue is disappearing. So the rule that the higher bone marrow adipose tissue is always associated with loss of bone is not always the case because sometimes you see this reduction in adipose tissue associated with bone loss. And one of the more common complications we're seeing now from uh, calorie restriction is um, a gastric bypass. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, bone loss is persistent uh, in individuals that undergo uh, bypass, whether it's ruin Y or vertical sleeve gastrectomy. And our group, along with Orman McDougall uh, in Michigan, has been studying the uh, degree of bone loss and marrow fat loss that occurs after vertical sleeve gastrectomy in mice. And here you can see that there's fairly dramatic bone loss. And at the same time, uh, marrow fat uh, almost disappears. And this is very interesting from a uh, biological point of view, but also from a clinical point of view, since uh, long-term 
uh, the vertical sleep gastrectomy patients are going to still have to deal with uh, their skeleton over time, and the persistence of bone loss may be a major problem. On the other hand, exercise probably reduces marrow fat. This is work from Linda Bonewald at the um, at the University of Indiana, where she exercised a group of black six mice and another group just got their regular uh, mouse housing. And you can see the difference in marrow adiposity in this cross-sectional study uh, that exercise was able to reduce uh, the amount of age-related marrow adipose tissue. These are 24-month mice where you usually see a fair amount of marrow fat. So in summary to part one, Marrow adipose tissue is present in all species and increases with age. It is regulated by hormonal and nutrient and environmental factors. High bone marrow adipose tissue is often associated with lower bone mass, but not in all circumstances. And the type of function of the marrow adipocyte is an ongoing exploration. So where do marrow adipocytes come from and where do they go? So when we were addressing the question of what is this depot, we had to ask initially, where did these adipocytes come from? What's driving marrow adipogenesis and what models could we use to help us understand um, that? So first we had to try to figure out if the adipocyte in the marrow is different from the adipocyte in subcutaneous tissue, from the adipocyte in visceral tissue, from the adipocyte in brown, in brown fat. And indeed it is, and I hope to be able to show you that in even greater detail. But then the question came up, so where, where do they originate from? Well, the marrow is the most likely source since that's where the adipocytes are. But what were these cells? And so, um, so the traditional sort of paradigm has been this sort of scheme where you have these mesenchymal stem cells in different, uh, different states of dif differentiation or pre-differentiation. And then the idea is, is that there are signals that go to the osteoblast that prevent it from going to the adipocyte as we talked about with parathyroid hormone, and that these cells then become terminally differentiated and not interchangeable. Although there are uh, people who believe, and it's still an unresolved issue, is whether they can de-differentiate these adipocytes or trans-differentiate into osteoblasts. So uh, lineage tracing has helped us understand a little more about these uh, marrow adipocytes. And using uh, two labeling, uh, dual labeling with GFP and uh, tomato red, uh, one can get an appreciation uh, in a transgenic mouse models of what, um, of what the uh, marrow adipocyte is uh, really originating from. And here you can see, no surprise, that if you label for adiponectin, that uh, every one of these adipocytes actually uh, lights up green for GFP for adiponectin. Um, and tomato red is for everything else. And you can also see that MIF5, which is a measure of uh, a transcription factor that is associated with brown adipose tissue, it's also a muscle specific transcription factor. None of the adipocytes uh, appear to show MIF5. And then PDF, PDGF receptor alpha, which labels virtually all peripheral adipocytes in the subcutaneous and uh, gonadal depots label about 50% of the adipocytes. And this was our first clue that these fat cells in the marrow are slightly different. Um, Rosiglitazone, which has been used in the past to treat diabetes, is a potent inducer of PPAR gamma. And it is one of the easiest ways to drive marrow adipose tissue in mouse models. It's probably a sledgehammer, so we don't use it as much uh, as um, we'd like to because it probably overdoes the situation. But you can see here that um, when they're labeled with the PRX, which is a, uh, an early marker of the adipocyte uh, and mesenchymal progenitor lineage, with rosy glitazone, you get this marked and florid uh, induction of marrow fat, which labels with PRX, uh, which is an early marker. And the other marker that we found useful in the marrow is Osterix, which is SP7. It's a, a bone uh, transcription factor, but is expressed early in the mesenchymal lineage. So all these experiments, which take time, are expensive, and their pretty pictures don't really help us 
understand the origin as much as we'd like uh, and the uniqueness of the marrow adipocyte. So we've turned to another model system that was created uh, with our collaborator, Orman McDougall, and that's called the fat mouse. And here we're overexpressing using the Osterix promoter, um, Osterix positive cells, which we know label in the marrow, but not in the periphery, and then use an endogenous adiponectin promoter to generate these fat mice, which uh, label only the marrow adipocyte. And so we can now separate peripheral fat from what happens with marrow fat. And we've done a number of experiments crossing these mice with uh, ATGL uh, uh, null mice and shown that you can really generate huge amounts of fat in the marrow, larger adipocytes. And this occurs only in the uh, bone marrow. So we're beginning to have models that separate out what happens in the marrow from what happens elsewhere. Previous models had used promoters like PPR gamma uh, to, to delete or overexpress it. And in those circumstances, you got both peripheral and marrow uh, expression here. The fat mouse is very helpful. But I will say that probably the biggest development did not come from our lab at all, but came from uh, Ling Ken's lab at the University of Pennsylvania. And there she did some really industrial size mapping using different uh, promoters to identify a popular and single cell uh, um, RNA to really identify this population of cells in brown that go on temporally to become adipocytes. And you can sort of see that bridging that occurs over time. And these uh, adipocyte progenitors have a very specific label uh, and, and she's called them marrow adipocyte-like progenitors. And they express a certain um, a group of uh, markers that are extremely um, unique to these progenitors, PDGF receptor beta, uh, laminin B1, VEGFC, uh, angiopoietin 4, uh, and uh, a couple, uh, the leptin receptor. And it turns out that these, you can then sort for these marrow dipside like progenitors, and they've been found to produce not just becoming adipocytes, but also releasing factors that can drive bone resorption, hematopoietic maintenance, vessel maintenance, and suppress bone formation. So we think now that we have a handle on what that progenitor is. And what's most important is these MALPs are not present in peripheral fat tissue. So basically, the underlying story is, is that bone marrow adipocytes are unique, that they are dynamic within the developmental distinction, and that they, their progenitors are destined uh, to become marrow adipocytes. The question for us is, what are the signals uh, that nutrients do to affect marrow adipocytes? I have to turn on the lights. They went out for a second. There we go. Okay. So let's, um, so let's go back to the paradox. We now know where the marrow adipocyte comes from. The next question really relates to why, are the, um, why does this happen with nutrient intake that you can understand with a high calorie diet why they store fat, and, but you can't really contemplate how, why is it that in states of nutrient starvation, you get the exact same phenomena. And th this has bothered me for 15 years when I was at the University of Maine, I was on a thesis committee, uh, a wildlife thesis committee. We had a brilliant internist that I was working with who was studying bear physiology and how they uh, responded in terms of their skeleton to, to uh, long-term hibernation. And at the time I was on the committee, I made the comment that we were shocked at the amount of bone marrow adipose tissue in, in in the bears during hibernation. And the, the chair of the department laughed and said, don't you know that all starving animals have high marrow fat? And don't you know that the roadkill you see on the side of the road that's being picked by the birds are actually picking that rich marrow fat and the starve, starving animals are, are coming to the road because they're looking for food. Well, so that proves that marrow fat 
is a, a universal mammalian phenomenon. So we decided to address the question by first going to the mouse and asking if we fed them a high fat diet, would we get uh, increased marrow adiposity? Well, this had been done many times before, but this time we wanted to look more closely at what was happening with the marrow fat. What was driving changes in the bone in relation to marrow fat? And this is just uh, the, the case that yes, we do see an increase in marrow fat in black six mice. It's not dramatic, it's not consistent, but the mean values are higher. And when we look at RNA-seq and we look at some other markers, particularly macrophage markers, what we see is that there is an increase in a certain number of uh, macrophage-specific markers, the F480 uh, markers, that suggest that during high-fat diet, there's an inflammatory response in the marrow. We've known for a long time that that occurs in the periphery and that you get this uh, macrophage response, inflammation, uh, as the adipocyte expands. Well, it looks like that's happening in the marrow to a certain degree. And when we look a little more closely at that, we can see that, interestingly enough, during that expansion of the marrow adipocyte, we do see an increase, actually, in the number of short-term uh, hematopoietic stem cells that are generated, and this increase in the macrophage lineage. So we were very interested in understanding whether this was a mouse a specific process or this occurred in humans as well. So this is the study that we did. It was part of uh, R24 from NIDDK. Uh, and what we wanted to test was if the changes in marrow adiposity occurred in humans as they did in mice, and was there any difference between the marrow adipocyte from a high calorie diet and the marrow adipocyte from fasting? So uh, we recruited 26 individuals. We paid them $7,000 a piece uh, at the end of the study. Um, they came to the Mass General to uh, the clinical research unit, uh, and they were first administered a high calorie diet. Then they went home for two weeks, and then they fasted for uh, 10 days. So each of the intervals of, in of nutrient changes were 10 days of high calorie, 10 days of fasting with a two-week washout period. Uh, in the process, they got a bone marrow aspirate at the beginning and at the end of the period. Uh, we couldn't get any of the uh, volunteers to uh, be subject to four bone marrow aspirates, but we did get 10 individuals to have, uh, uh, to have uh, paired bone marrows at the beginning at the end. Some were fasting, some were high calorie diet. Okay, and then we approach this by uh, doing uh, uh, unbiased uh, analysis, and I'll come back to that in a second for a number of different uh, factors. So we take the bone marrow out, we immediately uh, spin it, we take off the top section, which is the bone marrow adipocyte, we have an intermediate layer of marrow serum, and then we have the stromal vascular fraction in the, in the bottom, which we had much more trouble isolating those, mainly due to the fact that our lab is two hours away and, and we couldn't get that. So we'll focus mostly on the marrow serum and of course the marrow adipocytes. So no surprise if you, uh, you know, the high calorie diet was, uh, was based on uh, an estimate of calories for a 7% weight gain during the 10 day period using the uh, Mif Mifflin St. George equation with an activity factor of 1.3. And this paper is in press at JCI Insight. So no big surprise, they gained weight. With fasting, they lost weight. During the two week stabilization, um, uh, their, their weight was uh, neutralized. So, so overall, uh, we did what we thought we wanted to do. And of course, we did MRI spectroscopy as part of this. So we were able to actually quantitate bone marrow adipose tissue in vivo, as well as getting out the adipocytes. Uh, and as you can see, with overfeeding, you do see this percent change in bone marrow adipose tissue by MR spectroscopy. But much like the mouse, it's not as consistent as one would hope. You see three, five of the 12 had increases, but some did not. Whereas with fasting, virtually everybody had an increase. So that told us 
that fasting is probably a better stimulus to marrow adiposity than overfeeding, which is what we learned in the mouse a few years ago, but we were surprised uh, to see it in humans as well. But even more surprising to us was the fact that within two weeks, that whole process was reversed. So we know in the mouse with rapid metabolics that they can change very quickly. We never expected that uh, two weeks after a, a, a fast that all the marrow fat would disappear, or I mean, the ones that had changed had, would disappear uh, when they went back to normal uh, feeding. Uh, so, and, and for the most part, uh, overall at the end of the experiment, except for one individual, uh, the bone marrow adipose changes were uh, zero. So this suggested to us that this is a very dynamic process and the bone marrow uh, is sensing these changes in nutrients very quickly. And this has implications as we get to later in the story about what happens during uh, intermittent fasting or alternate day fasting or even temporal uh, changes in, in diet. So this is just the summary with fasting, and I'm going to focus virtually all my rest of my talk on fasting uh, because um, nobody has this kind of data, but it's just really been remarkable and eye-opening for us. So um, body weight decreases with fasting, lean body mass decreases, and bone marrow adiposity increases. So again, this paradox of what's going on. Uh, and with this, uh, unlike high fat diet, where there was virtually no change in markers of bone turnover, in the fasting individuals, there was a marked increase in CTX or bone resorption. And we see this not just with fasting, but with vertical sleeve gastrectomy. It occurs rapidly uh, and it, it stays up for a period of time with VSG uh, longer than would be expected. So bone resorption is going up during fasting. And one of our stories is trying to understand what's driving it. Are those MALPs releasing substances that drive the osteoclast? At, at the same time, serum IGF goes down and IGF BP2 goes up. So we were really excited about this data, but we realized one important thing, the bone marrow compartment is unique. And what you see in the marrow, in the serum, in the circulation may not be what you see in the marrow. Now, I will always believe that if you take marrow serum, it's just a fraction of the circulating serum. That just doesn't turn out to be the case. And I should point out there are lots of richness in this data set because other things change as well. TNF goes up with a high fat diet, which has been seen in other studies. GDF 15 goes up with fasting. Um, I won't focus on a lot of these changes. Uh, but just focus on, on what's happening in the marrow uh, itself. So how do we do that? So we first took a biased uh, PCR approach. We had marrow adipocytes. We'd say, we know what's going on. High fat diet increases inflammation. And our hypothesis was fasting reduces inflammation since fasting or calorie restriction has been shown as, as Sai has worked on for a long time, <laughs> this idea that it's very protective of, uh, of tissue and may improve longevity. So we had that down, we knew what we wanted to look for, but we decided to uh, uh, put a cautionary note in there and do some unbiased approaches. So we did proteomics. So we took the proteins in the marrow serum and compared them to the proteins in the circulation. We did lipidomics in the marrow serum and in the circulation. And most importantly, we did RNA-seq in, um, in the marrow adipocytes. So the first thing we see in this PCA analysis is, whoa, wait a minute, bone marrow serum is very different from peripheral blood serum. There really isn't much overlay in terms of the proteins that uh, we're measuring. So bone marrow serum in this quadrant, peripheral blood in this column with fasting, same thing with high calorie diet. So they're distinct. And this, and this already proved my first hypothesis wrong that we were pulling out marrow serum, which was really just the circulation. And when we look a little more closely at the proteomics, we can see that there's a big difference in the pattern. You're just looking at this um, from a, a bird's eye view. You can see that the gene expression uh, magnitudes are different and that the uh, proteins are very different. 
And so when we looked a little more closely at just fasting, and here we're just talking about fasting, and th this is the heat map of fasting versus high calorie diet. But if we put that aside and just look at the uh, bone marrow serum um, uh, fasting, uh, it's very different than high calorie. So remember, it's different than circulation. And now we see a marked difference between the fasting and the high calorie. So right away, this suggests to us that the proteomics in the marrow serum make the marrow adipocyte different in terms of what's happening within this compartment. And what we were most surprised about is that, yes, there were some inflammatory components in the high calorie diet, but in the uh, fasting bone marrow, there was this tremendous uh, consistency for the top pathway to be complement activation. And this appeared to be through the alternate, alternative complement activation pathway, what they call the lectin or lectin mannose pathway, which is the second uh, complement pathway. And so this struck us one as being interesting, but also raised the question whether uh, fasting was actually an inflammatory process within the marrow. And of course, we didn't pick up any of this in the circulation. So the other thing we did was we looked at lipidomics. And here we found that, not surprising, that bone marrow adipose tissue in high fat diet situations or high calorie diet situations were definitely uh, saturated fat, fatty acids, whereas in these uh, fasting uh, bone marrow, the lipidomics were consistent with uh, 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 unsaturated fat. So the saturation index was high with high fat diet and lower with um, uh, fasting. And this was also established with uh, MR spectroscopy. Um, but one of the other surprises we found was that when we looked by Lyon at the enrichment analysis, we came up with a very interesting story. So during fasting, actually lipid storage and lipid droplets increased. Uh, and this um, was really interesting for us uh, because we had projected that the uh, adipocytes would be lipolytic and that they would be releasing fatty acids as an attempt to preserve a systemic metabolism. But I think these uh, adipocytes are very selfish and they are really storing fat during the time of uh, uh, fasting. And what appears likely is that the, the storage is occurring by the uh, marrow adipocyte actually extracting fatty acids from the circulation and from the marrow serum. The marrow serum is actually uh, the adipocytes are pulling up these fatty acids and storing them. When we look at the high calorie diet, it's just the opposite. So one would have expected the marrow adipocyte to store fat during that period, uh, and they don't. They downregulate lipid storage. So the marrow adipocyte is a unique adipocyte. It's doing exactly the opposite of peripheral adipocytes. And we suspect that's because they're selfish. They want to preserve the marrow, and they particularly want to preserve the hematopoietic stem cell. And during this wildlife thesis committee, the, the guy made an offhanded comment, well, well, what do you think the two major lipids uh, store, uh, what are the two major uh, fat sites that are preserved in starving animals that we see in these very starved animals? And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, marrow and uh, the adrenal gland. Uh, which is really interesting. All the other fat tissues go away with starvation. So there's a preservation mechanism. I suspect in the adrenal, it might have to do with catecholamines, fight and flight. But in the marrow, they're saving up these fats for something. So we then wanted to really ask what was happening um, in the marrow adipocyte. So again, as I reminded you, our strategy was two-pronged. We wanted a targeted QRT-PCR, which we did. Uh, and we also did the unbiased RNA-C. And here, no surprise, but TNF-alpha was increased with high-fat diet. It was not increased with fasting. Um, uh, and um, also uh, plexin D1 and semaphore and 3E. Plexin D1 is a receptor for macrophages. 
uh, and uh, semaphorin 3E is a, uh, a inflammatory marker. So high calorie diet in the marrow is associated with some increase in this, this inflammation and it's accompanied by an increase in macrophages. Not unsurprising to us. Uh, and our corollary hypothesis was that fasting would do just the opposite, that this would be a preservation phenomena, there would not be inflammation, and that the marrow adipocyte was protected uh, in this specific niche. So uh, this is the first of the series of unbiased uh, um, data analyses that we did uh, using string analysis. And you can see that a number of different biological processes were activated by fasting in the marrow adipocyte. And the circle represents this uh, complement of uh, three major uh, uh, activation pathways, the extracellular matrix, IGFs and IGFBPs, and complement. So remember, complement came up in our proteomics as well. And this really intrigued us rather uh, remarkably. So um, we subsequently did a series of reviews of the RNA-seq. And what we found was this marked difference between what happens in the marrow adipocyte and what happens in the, um, with fasting versus what happens with high calorie diet. And I can go through some of the lists, but I'll just tell you um, uh, Cordin-1, uh, which is a BMP antagonist, was markedly upregulated. Dipinectin, our friend of dipinectin, which we talked about previously, the leptin receptor, CXCL, which is stromal differentiation factor, factor which enhances hepatopoietic stem cell recruitment, IGFBP3, I, and um, laminin B1. So these particular genes that I've focused on just in this picture are genes that are also present on the Broad Institute uh, uh, maps of the MALPS genes that are expressed um, uh, in pre-adipocytes. And so what we found basically was many of the genes that were upregulated during fasting were genes related to the recruitment of, adip of those marrow adipocyte-like progenitors. So what we were seeing was these MALPs that were very activated during fasting and not uh, with a high calorie diet. In fact, if one looked, they were all, um, they were all down regulated during a high, the high calorie diet. So we then looked at um, um, heat maps and did another analysis at the activation pathways, looking at both the reactome and um, some of the other uh, methods to uh, quantitate differences and look at different pathways. Um, and as you can see to the right, the IGF-BP system is markedly upregulated, IGF-BP7, IGF-BP3, IGF-BP2 in the marrow adipocyte, supporting this idea that there is this uh, enhancement of binding proteins that may be antagonistic to IGF, uh, uh, bioactive IGF. Um, in addition to that, though, the uh, complement pathway uh, intrigued us tremendously, and we were trying to understand how that uh, pathway was activated and why would it be activated during states of fasting, because complement is in the alternative pathway is something that is used to help lice uh, uh, infections, uh, uh, bacterial uh, infections, and uh, is a major uh, recruiter of uh, other uh, activators of um, the inflammatory response, such as uh, lymphocytes and uh, macrophages. So this was a total surprise to us uh, and consistent from both the proteomics and the um, uh, RNA-seq. So um, I, it, this was inadvertent and sort of a mistake, but as I was going through, we were listing all the complement factors that were upregulated. And uh, I didn't realize at the time that complement factor D is also called adipsin. And adipsin is a, a, a adipokine that's released. It's only made in adipocytes. And it's, at, it, it, it's been shown uh, to be immediately downstream 
uh, PPAR gamma when it's acetylated and activated. So it's one of the top downstream signaling genes uh, that occurs with activation of PPAR gamma with drugs such as rosiglitazone. And it turns out that adipsin is an important component in the complement pathway, and that this is a part and parcel. It's a serine protease, and it breaks down um, C4B and C2A to allow C3 convertase to act on C3 to begin the alternate pathway amplification. So I presented this last week and uh, talked about it, and there's an investigator at Columbia uh, Lee King, who uh, happens to be very interested in adipsin, and this data is part of his uh, seminal work on adipsin. So uh, just a little background, I'm uh, coming to the close of my talk, but adipsin, uh, Bruce Spiegelman had reported seven years ago that adipsin uh, was downstream of PPAR, but it was an important stimulator of insulin secretion. Um, and during high fat feeding and type 2 diabetes, adipsin is markedly downregulated. Uh, and that th there had been some work on adipsin as a driver for uh, type 2 diabetes commercially, never really went very far. Uh, in this most recent work from Kiang and colleagues, what he's able to show is that if you knock out adipsin, you not only reduce the amount of marrow adipose tissue, it almost goes away. Uh, during calorie restriction. So you can see the wild type, huge increases in marrow adipocytes, almost none with the dipsin. But not only did that, but it increases bone mass at the same time. A dipsin null mice have much higher bone mass. And when you treat with rosy glitazone, they're resistant to rosy induced bone loss. So this raises the possibility that a dipsin is at the nexus of both complement activation and uh, bone marrow adiposity, and may be an essential feature of the uh, importance of marrow fat storage during um, states such as calorie restriction. And importantly, the dipsin is also markedly upregulated in the marrow with aging in mice, and that this may be the major driver of bone marrow adiposity with aging. So in summary, we think that there are two different types of marrow adipocytes functionally during nutrient intake. One, during calorie restriction or fasting, you get this driver, which is adipsin, which is not increasing the size of the adipocyte, but recruiting progenitors. And we know this because many of those lineage factors, leptin receptor and adiponectin and um, CXCL and uh, others are actually markedly upregulated. And we think it's because they're driving these amero adipocyte like progenitors to become adipocytes. At the same time, there's an inflammatory response, which is complement mediated. And um, that response leads to changes in the marrow, which may be injury nonspecific. It may occur with other things as well. This is what we're trying to understand. Or is it a signal that occurs during fasting that's regulated centrally? We don't know the answer. On the other hand, with a high calorie diet, there were virtually no changes in those adipocyte transcription factors. Everything was related to hypertrophy or enlargement of the adipocyte. So in summary, the marrow and serum adipocyte compartments are distinct from the circulation and peripheral fat depots. We think high fat diet does induce a macrophage inflammatory response. Fasting induces an immune response, which was a surprise to us with the deposition of extracellular matrix, growth factor recruitment and stimulation of bone resorption, as well as the accumulation of unsaturated fatty acids. Uh, the contrast in gene upregulation between fasting and high calorie diets support unique adipocyte activation that's determined by the nutrient uh, intake. So what are our challenges? So we don't, we still don't know a lot. We're coming to the 10th year of our uh, program project from NIDDK and it's finishing up. And I think there are as many questions at the end as when we started, but um, what is the turnover, turnover rate of marrow adipocytes? So we see them in the bone marrow, but what are they doing? Are they active? Are they inactive during steady state periods? 
And what happens to the marrow adipocyte after lipolysis? So I already showed you that sometimes the adipocyte does shrink. What's happening there? And how does it differ uh, depending on nutrient intake? And what happens to that adipocyte? Does it transdifferentiate? Does it uh, dedifferentiate? We don't know. How does the immune innate immune system get activated by fasting? And, the, and is this the major driver for a bone loss, which occurs not just with calorie restriction or with uh, fasting, but also with ver vertical sleeve gastrectomy or any type of gastric bypass? Also, how does the extracellular matrix mediate IGF's action? So we know that ECM deposition is actually very important during adipocyte differentiation and um, hypertrophy. And the question that we have is trying to understand how does IGF fit into that? We know that IGF BPs can anchor to the extracellular matrix. What we're trying to understand is how does that allow for um, uh, attachment of the adipocytes or for other changes? And finally, we're very interested, and we have a couple of pilots submitted in Boston um, to understand whether intermittent fasting activates the innate immune system. And if it does, does it relate to bone loss? So with that, I'll finish. I think I have 10 minutes of time saved up for me. These are the lab members in our lab uh, in 2021 with masks. Uh, but this is all a collaborative process with many, many uh, collaborative investigators and my appreciation to NIH for uh, um, Mark's support for, for many of these projects. So with that, I think I'll stop. I'll stop sharing and I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rosen, for that fascinating talk. Uh, we'll go on to our first question from Dr. Michael Lasgarden. He asks, a high-fat diet is notably absent in soluble fiber, which suggests a role for the gut microbiome on marrow adiposity. If this hypothesis is true, one would expect less marrow adiposity in germ-free mice that are fed a high-fat diet. Has that experiment been performed? Yeah, so uh, in germ-free environment, it's interesting, there actually is more marrow adipose tissue, which is really uh, kind of surprising. That's work from Roberto Pacifici. I don't know particularly about the high fat diet induction of marrow fat in the germ-free environment. So it, it, it's interesting because we're, we're teamed with this uh, new biotech firm, Solario Bio, that's doing deep sequencing with um, with uh, the uh, um, uh, microbiome to try to understand if that is a process that's occurring. So it's a great question. I don't have the answer to the second part of that. But it, it's clear that the adipose tissue changes um, significantly uh, with germ-free diet and in a, in a different direction that you might expect, a germ-free environment. Great, thank you. The next question is from Dr. Larry Parnell. Um, he first of all compliments you and thanks you for the insightful talk, packed with so much new knowledge. His question um, asks, in comparing postmenopausal women with men, do you see in your work or in work from others any sex-based differences in marrow adiposity and its regulation, particularly with the response to diet? Yes, great question. Yes, so in mice, for sure, male mice have a much more vigorous response to a high fat diet than do females. In fact, we just don't use females because they don't gain marrow fat. And similarly, they don't gain as much peripheral fat. And yes, uh, I, we think that's estrogen mediated, that that dampens the, uh, the response to a high fat diet. Um, when you take away estrogen, though, then the, the whole story changes that sexual dimorphism is gone and females and males do just about the same in terms of their response. So estrogen is a may, and androgens are not. Estrogen uh, tends to be the major uh, driver of suppressing marrow adipogenesis and protecting the marrow from, uh, from these changes. And one could argue that the postmenopausal osteoporotic state in part is due in fact to the absence of estrogen leading to increases in marrow adipocytes, which drive bone resorption. And that probably is one element of what happens uh, during uh, bone loss with uh, menopause. But that's a great question. And, uh, uh, and that's about as far as we know. And I should say, we don't know the mechanism of estrogen suppression of marrow adiposity. 
even though that was the first thing ever described uh, in terms of marrow fat was postmenopausal estrogen deficiency. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Christopher Wiley. Um, he says, marrow adiposity seems to be adaptive and protective according to your story, but is it yeah. also deleterious? You see bone loss with fasting. Does the adiposity contribute to this and does the bone loss recover as rapidly as bone adipose tissue is lost upon return to normal diet or is it more lasting? Yeah. So I think that point's very well taken. It's both adaptive and protective. And so with you know fasting, that bone resorption continues. Um, and with 30% calorie restriction, we know in the mouse that you still get bone loss. And in humans, as you know, uh, uh, from, sorry, from, uh, from the work of calorie, that um, there is a fairly consistent bone loss that occurs with 30% calorie restriction. Most of it occurs early in the process, so I'm not sure it continues unabated. I think a new steady state is present. And the more fundamental question and a good one that was asked is it, what's contributing to that bone loss? And you know we've struggled with this for a long time because we know weight loss in general causes bone loss and it's independent of the degree of weight loss. Uh, and so we think that yes, the marrow adipose tissue or the MALPS may be contributing or driving that uh, bone loss. So, and there's some new data and data from our lab that we didn't have the opportunity to publish as quickly as others, that the marrow adipocyte is a major source of rankle. Uh, and as is the marrow adipocyte like progenitor. So rankle drives osteoclastogenesis and it's probably a, a greater source of rankle than is the marrow stromal cell that's destined to become an osteoclast. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Shang Dong Wang asks, can the down regulation of PPAR gamma adiponectin axis by high calorie feeding or fasting contribute to increased bone marrow adiposity? Yeah, so so that's a great question. And you know, we struggle with PPAR gamma because its changes by gene expression are so minimal, but its activity can be so altered. And so um, so that's a great question. And and you know, in the marrow, um, when we looked at the lipidomics and we saw the suppression of lipid storage, we wondered whether in fact that PPAR was being suppressed at that stage. When we looked by RNA-seq, uh, PPAR certainly does not go up during high fat or high calorie feeding, uh, but it does go up slightly with fasting. And I think that's what's driving the progenitor recruitment. So the answer to your question, I don't know for sure, but I think that's one element in the story that you're not driving new marrow adipocytes during high fat feeding as much as you're just increasing the storage of them. Thank you. Um, Dr. Alex Lixentine asks, do you have any thoughts with regards to differential effects of different fatty acids? Could the increase in polyunsaturated fatty acids be related to the, um, for example, the substance for inflammatory factors? Yeah, so I think that's a great question and we're currently exploring that, but that definitely is, uh, you know, the, the, those fatty acids can signal and we're trying to understand if that is one of the local signals that actually, you know, as you drive fasting, the conversion from saturated to unsaturated fatty acids is occurring locally, we think, and that may be directing the marrow adipogenesis, so yes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Shang Dong Wang asks again, can decreased bone marrow uh, adipocytes during aging contribute to bone marrow cancer development or cancer metastasis to the bone? So that's a great question. And I will tell you that uh, Michaela Reagan in our institute uh, just got a merit award from NCI to look at myeloma related marrow adiposity. And her hypothesis is, and she has some great data, there's a new paper in cancer research that we all contributed to, to show that fatty acid binding protein four and five are essential elements that are driving the uh, myeloma uh, tumor response in the marrow uh, in, in animals that have high fat diet or uh, calorie restriction. So as the adipocyte increases and starts releasing more fatty acid binding proteins, that may actually drive more uh, uh, myeloma uh, 
uh, proliferation and uh, certainly resistance to dexamethasone uh, in the experimental myeloma. So yes, great question. There's a lot more uh, information now on marrow adiposities relationship, still correlative uh, to uh, tumor genesis in the marrow itself. Thank you. Dr. Andrew Greenberg asks, is there a relationship between osteoclast and macrophages in bone and bone marrow? Yeah, great question. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we don't know what happens to those osteo those macrophages. Those F480 positive macrophages could become osteoclasts. And we're still trying to understand that. Um, and, and so that's, that's really a relevant question. Um, are they M1? Are they M2? Are they just destined to become osteoclasts because F480 is an early marker of macrophages? We don't know the answer to that, but that's a great question and actually something that I need to come back to again uh, in our flow studies, but great question. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Booth asks, given the disconnect between what happens in the serum versus BMAT, what biomarkers can be used to study <laughs> in larger human cohorts? <laughs> great question. We're struggling with that because, for example, a dipsin goes down in the circulation with high fat diet um, and, uh, and fasting, it doesn't change. And yet you get this big increase in the marrow, both in the serum and marrow serum, but more importantly in the adipocyte expression. So a lot of these, we're struggling with trying to find the surrogate that actually reflects what's happening in the marrow. One surrogate that we do know is the change in IGF and IGF-BP2. So the ratio of IGF-1 to IGF-BP2 uh, goes down with, um, with um, fasting. So you, you reduce IGF-1, IGF-BP2 goes up in the serum, as I showed you. And the same thing happens in the marrow adipocyte. IGF-1 expression goes down, IGF-BP2 expression goes up. And in the reactome that we looked at, this was also the case. So it's a marker, but the problem with IGFs, and I've been in this business for 35 years, is that it's, it's sort of too good of a surrogate. It reflects almost anything you do. So it doesn't help us specifically identify this as being related to a particular process in the marrow. But we continue to look for those things. And my postdoc now is just running an, another adipsin uh, 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 assay in the bone marrow serum of the fasting individuals to see what the actual proteomic uh, quantitation is of adipsin. We know it's upregulated in the adipocyte. We'd like to know how to compare it with the circulation during fasting, which we don't know, um, and the circulation in the marrow. So uh, those are ongoing quests, but we would hope that a dipsin could be a marker, but I don't think so because of the way it changes with uh, in the circulation versus what's happening in the marrow. At least that's our preliminary thinking. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Rosen. That was an amazing talk and thanks for all the wonderful um, responses to the quest many great questions we had today. Um, to our audience, remember um, next Monday, we will not have a seminar due to the Patriot Day holiday and thank you all for attending and for your engagement. Thanks everyone. You can stay on Dr. Rosen. Oh, okay. Uh, just, well, yeah, thank you. again, just want to formally thank you. And uh, yeah, it was just fascinating and amazing. What a bear, right? You know, starting